welcome to Furious Driving. And today I'm at the wheel of a car whose boxy arches almost defined a generation of GM cars. Yes, it's the Nova, the Corsair A if you're watching in Europe. And this isn't just any Nova. This is a Nova Solar, one of the rarest special editions and definitely one of the rarest survivors out there. So now, do me a favor and hit subscribe because I need this channel to grow a lot in the near future. And while you do that, here's a word from our sponsors and then we'll be on with the video. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. So this is a Vauxhall Nova Solar, one of the rarest Novas you're ever going to come across. Or of course, if you're in Europe, it's a Corsa A. Now it's unlike General Motors to be behind the ball late to the party to anything ever. So it's a massive surprise that virtually all the competition had got a Super Mini on the market way before the Corsa A came to market in 1982 across mainland Europe. So things like the Fiat 127, the Ford Fiesta, the Panda, these We'll ignore them and say this was a pioneer. It really wasn't, but it was Vauxhall's first front wheel drive, transverse engined hatchback super mini. This is replacing effectively the Chevette, or Cadet in Europe. So that was a larger car in a slightly different category. And this is really Vauxhall Opel's first entry into this whole new market. Now I can already hear your keyboards clattering that I said 1982. The Nova came out in 1983 because it took the best part of nine months for them to get the right hand drive car actually up and running and in, on sale. And this is partly due to the fact it was built in Spain at the Zaragoza plant. And that meant there were a number of issues with unions and workforce here in the UK at Halwood and Luton, not being particularly happy about that. And also there's the question of the name, Corsa. They didn't like it in the UK. They thought it sounded like Corsa, as in coarse, rude, not, not good. So the Corsa name didn't appear until the Corsa B, which is of course called the Corsa over here as well, by which point no one cared. Now the styling of the Nova slash Corsa really did set it apart against its competitors because a lot of them had been out for a couple of years by that point and had a slightly previous decade look about them. This one though with its boxy arches and square edges had the true zeitgeist of the 80s. It was a real red braces and filofax wielding super mini for the future. And it looked really good. Thing is though, it stayed on the market until 1993. This one being a 1990 is a facelift car. This one though is a 1990 car in quite an unusual color as well. And so by the end of that decade, by 1993, it was starting to look a little bit old hat and desperately in need of replacement. Although in fairness, the Metro, which is one of his big rivals, was looking even older at the time. But this car, I said at the beginning, was one of the rarest Novas you're ever going to come across, and that's because, well, it is. This is the Nova Solar. A year before, Ford brought out the Fiesta Joy, which was effectively the same kind of idea. Big old sunroof on top, lots of toys inside, make a very, very special, special edition for the summertime. Not that uncommon Barristers and Opel over on the European mainland. Here in the UK, only 100 were built, and they're all sold out of London dealers. And this might sound crazy, you've got a summertime special, why aren't they selling it out of their big sort of seaside dealerships? But no, only in London. Today, there are three left, which is not big numbers, has to be said. Let's take a look around the spec and see what makes this thing so special. But in short, it's a very heavily specced SR with a smaller engine and no roof. Opel badge solars had these GTE alloys, but we only got hubcaps, so the owner added these when the car was restored. We've got unusual paint, there are 50 in red and 50 in this unusual colour. It's more of a magenta -y pink purple colour, it's quite interesting. You've got the special graphics on the back and of course you've got the full length electric slide back sunroof, which is pretty impressive. And we get the spoiler. We've got an electric aerial. And then we climb inside. Now we've got this rather cool tartan fabric across pretty much everything. These aren't the original seats, they were retrimmed about 10 years or so ago. And these are actually Fiesta, dare we say it, Ford seats in a Vauxhall car. Fiesta Recaros that have been trimmed and I think this is the correct uh, fabric for the car. We've got a three spoke leather wheel and we've got electric windows and this car's even got heated seats. I think they may have been aftermarket. Let's have a proper look around. So, first of all, this door with this amazing tartan fabric on the things. Got big sturdy door pull, very sturdy for a 1980s car. 
big speaker pod because that's how speakers worked in the 80s and 90s and the most practical door pocket I've seen in a long time got a big pocket a small slot a medium pocket so your stuff stays where you put it which is brilliant not too big a step to climb in the car Let's jump inside. We have got loads of cubby holes and spaces for things. We've got an exemplary T-shelf up top. We notice the exposed hex head screws pretty much everywhere. A little tiny T-shelf on the top so your sandwiches, your Mars bars can sit there, although quick chocolate warning, it will melt in the sun just there. That's textured so things won't fall out too much. Then we've got another storage area here on the left-hand side. Flat place for your 1990s brick mobile phone. Hello Alcatel, storage up there, got a good sized glove box which has got a modern radio hiding inside there very cunningly and space for cups of tea on the go with more storage underneath that. Moving back into the centre we've got twin air vents in the middle so you can direct your ventilation quite happily where you want it to go. The square hole with a round clock in the centre and the infamous hazard warning light switch, which as legend says on the Novas of old, if you broke into one of these cars, because I believe they're quite easy to break into with a screwdriver in the rear bumper hack, um, you could take out this, turn it upside down and push it in, and the car would start or, or something. That was a legend uh, that we told when I was at college back in the 90s. Underneath that we've got basic ventilation controls, heat, fan, direction, easy peasy, and this is excessively cool. This does have the original radio in a cupboard at home, but check out this 1990s-tastic Pioneer pull-out stereo. This is your 1990s parking the car starter kit part one. Push the little button, the metal handle pops forward, radio comes out of the dashboard, and away you walk with your radio cassette so it won't get stolen. This is absolutely brilliant. This is an absolute brick, and my college bag weighed an absolute ton because I think it was an Alpine I had, which had probably been stolen from another car thinking about it. That's why I got it so cheap. But that's only in there for show these days because the real music comes out of the modern one. But that is an absolutely awesome looking thing, whether it works or not. Real high-end pioneer there. That's above the cigarette lighter and the ashtray, which folds down, it's quite unusual. And there's two cubbies down there. A little cubby, bigger cubby, and we've got our electric window switches because we're in the posh seats here. Heated seats, so hot posh seats. And in the middle, we've got our five-speed manual gearbox. With a lovely round leather ball gear shifter, which is nice. Moving back up, and let's not ignore on the way through, we've actually got a mechanical choke, or a manual choke, I should say, on this car, into our little instrument binnacle, which has got fairly limited range of stuff to tell us about things. We've got temperature, we've got speed, we've got fuel, and we've got an array of, well, six warning lights. <laughs> Not too many. But what we have also got is more of these little square buttons. This is your rear fog light. This is your headlamp leveling. This is the same stuff as you'll find in dozens of other Vauxhall and Opel cars across the range from the cheapest at the bottom to the most expensive, all use roughly the same stuff. And that'll, whoa, that'll be our headlight on buzzer. And then we have this rather lovely detail of what looks like it could be a loudspeaker vent. Maybe on the more basic models it is a speaker. But most excitingly on this dashboard, we have these little BMW 3 Series style um, switches just here, which are for controlling the sunroof above us. Moving down, we've got another cubby and a further cubby. Now moving back, we have got standard Vauxhall Opel chunky controls for the stalks for indicators and wipers and moving further back we've got this rather splendid three spoke steering wheel padded leather feels absolutely amazing right let's take the Nova for a little drive oh we've got a choke you always forget to use a choke these days it's so rare you need one So the Nova was quite a sprightly handling car in its day. Today though, it does feel like a product of the 1980s, but not in a bad way. It's, uh, it's reminiscent of, of times gone by. The car was actually relatively advanced. It's a monocoque shell, obviously. It's got McPherson struts at the front, coil springs at the back, 
in terms of brakes, it's got drums at the back, discs at the front, so it's fairly well sorted. What is a little disconcerting is this gearbox because the range of movement between third and fourth, first and second, is really, really short. It doesn't feel like you've moved it far enough and it's not particularly positive when it goes in there. So it feels like you're just sort of pushing plastic against plastic to make it go. But it is going in there without any problems. And if you're not used to it, it feels like you should be doing more. Ooh, an H-van. You, my friend, can go. Under the bonnet, we've got a 1.2 litre lump, but there were a plethora of engines. There was a range of 11 petrol engines, starting with a 993 and a 1.2 litre OHV, and then a 1.2 to 1.6 Family 1 engine with carburetor or fuel injection, plus a pair of 1.5 Isuzu source diesels. This car though has a carb fed 1.2 Family 1, making either 55 or 58 horsepower, depending who you believe. So performance on this one is adequate rather than earth shattering. But in this particular instance, thanks to the lack of a roof, that's not necessarily a bad thing because although in day-to-day -day driving you don't really notice it, the owner does tell me that if you press on particularly hard in this car, you do start to feel quite a bit of scuttle shake and sort of flex in the body shell. So when he restored this back around 2010 or so, he took the engine out and all his friends were saying, why don't you put a 1.6 and turn it into a full-on GSI? And the answer is, because it would kill you. <laughs> so he stuck with the 1.2 and decided to just enjoy the car as it was intended. And I guess Vauxhall's engineers would have had the same questions and the same conversations because give an engineer a chance to stick a big engine in something, nine times out of 10 they will. If they haven't, there's probably a reason. But despite the whole lack of a roof situation, in day-to-day -day driving, it's actually quite a nimble, fun little car to drive. I don't think this one's got power steering on it. It certainly doesn't feel like it has at low parking speeds. That does kind of make it fairly rewarding when you turn into a corner and you can actually feel what the car really is doing. During the 90s, while Novas were an absolute staple of college car parks, they have all but disappeared now. But for a whole generation of people, this was the quintessential first car. It's either this or a Metro or a Fiesta for a huge swathe of the British population. So it's incredible how you just don't see them anymore. a little bit, but not too badly. Well, in a minute, I guess we get to find out whether or not the electric sunroof still works, because it's starting to rain, which is suboptimal. It's a bit like the time I took the Dino out, and the uh, owner had said, do try and keep it dry. And then a massive storm erupted halfway down the test route, <laughs> and the thing got absolutely soaked. Now it is an interesting contrast between this, the GM Platform S83 car, which is the Corsa A, and the S84, which is the Corsa B. Now you may recall we drove one of those on the channel a little while ago, about a year or so ago. And that felt, in many respects, a lot more modern than this, but mostly that was down to things like the fit and finish of the dashboard and the curves and things and the design. In terms of actual driving experience, there wasn't really a lot in it. At least not in day-to-day -day driving. The gearbox, I think, was a little bit nicer from memory. Now, the owner did warn me about the brakes on this car. As I say, the discs at the front, drums at the back. But the effectiveness of cars from 30-odd years ago, 30 to 40 years ago, and then their brakes. It's quite a surprise, even when they're working at their most optimal. A car like this, the brakes are a lot less sharp than what you're used to today, even on, even on super minis. Oh, intermittent wipe, that's nice. 
driving this thing really is the top of the tree when it comes to Novas and Corsa Rays. We've got all the toys, we've got our leather steering wheel, we've got electric windows, heated seats, electric aerial, and of course our fantastic full length sunroof. So you do feel a lot very much king of the courses rolling in this car. I am very much looking down on that Mariva that's in front of us just now. And it is such a shame that there are so few of these things left. I mean, I'll be honest, I didn't even know of this special edition before I was introduced to this car. There was one on eBay apparently a couple of days ago before this video was filmed, which was in need of full restoration. It was a Cat D write-off. And that was up for sale for £4,000, which is quite incredible. Oh, all the cool cars are out today. Now the sunroof is a full length sliding thing. As I say, it is electric with buttons which look like they're straight out of an E30 BMW. And it works like an old fashioned Wabasto like you'd find in a Rover P6 or a Jag or any number of other classics, a scimitar. So it has the slats that move backwards and forwards and the canvas or whatever other material it is and the fabric top rolls back with it giving a full length open top. It's pretty similar to a Fiat 500 actually current generation. Oh, 406! So many cool cars out today. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this insanely rare convertible Nova, if you never knew there was such a thing. If you've enjoyed this, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join us again next time driving something completely different.